Pokemon Go is a terrifying game, not just because it's setting up a massive surveillance state, and not just because of its expansion of augmented reality inside our own perception of reality. It goes beyond this. Pokemon Go might be conditioning us to accept the certain agenda, the ushering in of the Matrix, to accept that there might be another reality, another world, beyond our four dimensions. Everybody is digging the latest entry into the augmented reality genre. Millions upon millions of people are falling in love with it. The game's growth in a brief period has been so huge that experts are wondering the key to its success. How could a former children's cartoon turned game attract more than 75 million users in a couple of weeks in less than a week, Pokemon Go eclipsed the popular social app Tinder for daily users. Two days later, it had eclipsed Twitter. Pokemon is now more popular among adults than it is among children. Many of these adults have exclaimed how the app has helped them get more exercise as they go out looking for characters. Others have said that it helps them meet new people and interact more than ever before. Unlike traditional online gaming, Pokemon Go augments the surrounding environment so that you see things that aren't really there. It's like a hallucination created for you, completely controlled by the web. Normally, when a person has a hallucination, that person is treated with medicine, counseling, prayer, and other interventions in order to stop them from happening. Hallucinations happen when people see, hear, or feel things that aren't real. A variety of illegal drugs work as hallucinogens. They induce visual, auditory, and tactile stimulation meant to mimic a real experience. The recent epidemic of K2, or synthetic cannabis, is one such drug that can cause a strong hallucination. People who hallucinate often interact with what they visualize. They might try to touch or even talk to what they see. It can be a frightening experience for family members to watch loved ones who are trapped inside of their own augmented reality, believing something is happening when it isn't. In medicine, the goal is to return these people to reality and to control the hallucination. But not with Pokemon Go. In fact, you're encouraged to be a part of the hallucination that they have built on the World Wide Web. It isn't real, or so they say, but actually it is. It's molding together real and virtual, online and actual. It's combining the invisible matrix and the visible realm. Listen now, because this is very important. There is a certain agenda behind it all, and we are being conditioned to accept it. In order to get to the truth, we must travel back a bit in history. The game developer for Pokemon Go is Niantic, formerly owned by Google. Before its release, Niantic was heavily invested in an augmented reality game that garnered much less interest from the public. This game was called Ingress. What was the net effect of the Niantic project? We had crossed a threshold in which global security could be at risk. Decrypting the data was the mistake. This is not psychosis or some cognitive break, but an actual takeover of the mind. It cannot be understated the profound influence that Ingress had on Pokemon Go. In fact, both games share common elements. Players must visit portals all over the world and gain control of them. In Pokemon, the portals are called Pokestops and Gyms, which are guarded by the exotic creatures found in the cartoon. In Ingress, an alien force is behind the opening of the portals all over the world. Something is leaking through these portals and taking over everything. It's an unknown substance called exotic matter. Ingress begins its storyline at CERN, where physicists have identified the portals and the strange new form of matter coming through them from another dimension. CERN is acting as a conduit between our four dimensions and the new one. On the other side of the portal is an alien life form, and they are offering a promise 
to all of humanity. It is alleged the alien realm wants to assist humanity into the next stage of evolution. A player who chooses to fight against the agenda of the aliens is a part of the resistance. A player who decides to fight on behalf of the aliens and the evolution of the human species is called the Enlightened. Ingress has a terrifying mind control objective for players, and that is to gain access to the portals so that control fields can be created. The population trapped inside the control fields are called mind units. You'll notice a lot of occult symbolism for both the Enlightenment and the resistance sides contained in the game. Ingress displays an assortment of occult symbology throughout its online interface. The game logo is a cube with an upside down triangle, very stark emblems considering what they mean. The cube is a representation of the dimensions, but if one opens up the cube, there is something inside, and that's the upside down triangle. This stands for the coming of the other realm, the realm of the Benai Elohim. According to the most dedicated players of augmented reality, what they are doing is not a game. It's much more than that. You're encouraged to hallucinate. They're conditioning you to go a bit deeper than you ever have before into the matrix. They're trying to bring you further into the web that was birthed at CERN in 1989. It's the WWW. Is an alien force inside the CERN portal responsible for the WWW? Are they the masterminds behind the Matrix? One that has overtaken the entire world in less than three decades. Is the new ARG format meant to condition us, to catch us, and to control us inside the web? What better an idea than to take an innocent children's cartoon to introduce it? There is coming a time when all people on Earth will be forced to integrate with the Matrix. There will be consequences for those who refuse to become a part of it. Conditioning starts now. It will be mandatory later. People no longer love the truth, Jesus the Messiah. The Lord will send them a delusion. If you link three portals together, you've created a control field. Making that field means you control the territory within those portal boundaries. They will believe the lies of the one who is coming, the Antichrist. Hey guys, it's KJ from the Scariest Movie Ever channel on YouTube. I wanted to talk a little bit about this massive trend that seemed to come from out of nowhere, this Pokemon Go. So I watched a few news stories on this latest trend and watching the way people are reacting to Pokemon Go and what they're doing. And I couldn't help but just shake my head. You know, this is just another clear example of massive mind control. It's also signaling something from a video I just did recently on the coming post-human world. Because we really are at a crossroads right now. There was once a time where we controlled the technology. But we're literally on the precipice of technology controlling us. So I've never really looked much into Pokemon and I never played the game or anything. But I remember this story from some years back. It was the banned Pokemon episode that gave children seizures. The animators used a rapidly strobing type technique and it flashed red and blue lights on the screen. As soon as I saw the red and the blue involved here, it got me thinking of something else. Because this wouldn't be the first time that the colors red and blue were associated in one form or another with mind control. 
On the color wheel, red and blue aren't even connected together. They're actually opposed to one another. And colors do have a massive impact on our psyche. In a very basic sense, red excites and blue calms. Specifically going back to the article I was just showing you on the mind control they used in Pokemon, the red and the blue, the flashing images. So now you can imagine a child watching one of these animated shows where they take the red and the blue and they flicker them. It's a flicker rate. They start doing it really quick. These children's minds are still developing. They make them the perfect targets for these forms of mind control. A child will just sit there stunned staring at the screen while the red and the blue flicker, flicker, flicker. What's interesting to me about symbolism is that oftentimes there's multiple meanings to these symbols and these color codes. I've covered the red and the blue in the past in other videos, how often we see it. The color code of red and blue is really all around us, and I know you guys see it all the time as well. So in that respect, isn't it interesting just how much of this red and blue mind control that we see all around us, specifically in our entertainment, in our media, in one respect, I see it spiritually as choosing which side are you on. And of course, the red and the blue can be traced back to the Masons, back to the Lodge. So once again, isn't it interesting that we find red and blue, these diametrically opposed colors that can be used for a form of mind control, being the primary colors of Freemasonry. And of course, we find the red and the blue, right, with royalty, with the Queen. And that's a pretty famous picture, at least in our community of investigators and looking into this kind of stuff, but that's the belt buckle right there on the, uh, the lady in blue that's shaking hands with the queen in red. In case you weren't sure of the occult connections there. And then, of course, what do you get with the red and the blue, but you get the purple. And then, of course, in the occult studies, the purple goes back to Saturn. Saturn is Satan. One thing people rarely do is read the bottom line, read the print, <laughs> read any of this stuff. And I'm mainly talking about privacy policies that come along with a lot of these apps and stuff like that. This right here is part of Pokemon Go's policy, and <laughs> check this out. We cooperate with government and law enforcement officials or private parties to enforce and comply with the law. Check this. We may disclose any information about you or your authorized child that is in our possession or control to government or law enforcement officials or private parties as we, in our sole discretion, believe necessary or appropriate, a to respond to claims, legal process, subpoenas, to protect our property rights and safety, etc., safety of the third party or the public in general, and to identify and stop any activity that we consider illegal, unethical, or legally actionable activity. Reading that and considering what you're giving to Pokemon Go, you're literally giving them access to your immediate location and your camera. And you're also giving them full access to your Google account, assuming that's what you use to sign in. But legally, they've got you because they put it right here in print. It reminds me of some of YouTube's newer policies. We're seeing so many more videos over the last year or so getting removed from YouTube because they don't fall within community guidelines. And if you read their fine print, it's just like this, essentially giving Google, YouTube, all the power. And they get to decide, at their discretion, the company's discretion. And there are connections to the CIA when you start looking into this. For instance, Pokemon Go was actually created by a company called Niantic. And this is one of their symbols. And of course, we see the rings around Saturn, symbolically. And Niantic Labs was formed by John Hankey. So John Hankey had founded a company called Keyhole, and Keyhole was acquired by Google back in 2004. Now, Keyhole received funding from a firm called NQTEL. It's a government-controlled venture capital firm that invests in companies that will help beef up Big Brother's tool belt. And what's more, the funds NQTEL gave Keyhole mostly came from the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, whose primary mission is, quote, collecting analyzing and distributing geospatial intelligence. Now here's an excerpt from an in-house publication from the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. Data is king. All hail big data. At first glance, a big data solution may appear to be a silver bullet for an organization's needs. Certainly many sectors have urgent requirements that can be addressed with big data. 
Companies obtain customer information through avenues such as social media, mobile apps, and customer relationship management software. Government agencies such as the NGIA increasingly use big data analysis to derive meaning from the exponentially growing volume of data related to their missions. The main point of showing you some of this is so you understand just how entrenched the government is behind some of these things that seem so innocuous as a, you know, a Pokemon app. And now we come to the effects it has on the public. I've been into this kind of research for so many years now that I've got the point I don't like using the terms sheep for the general populace that's still asleep. Zombies, that's also another really popular term. Sometimes you just gotta call it what it is. And that's what all these stupid trends really do. They expose the zombies in our society. They expose the sheep or the sheeple in our society in many ways. This right here, of course, was called planking. You've probably seen this. One of those really dumb trends, right? It seemed to come from out of nowhere and suddenly it took the world by storm. Everybody's planking, essentially acting like they're dead. And who can forget the ridiculously retarded Kylie Jenner challenge, leaving teens' lips bruised and swollen. There was the dangerously dumb cinnamon challenge. Also, something else to note about all of these trends, these goofball trends that seem to just take over, right, from out of nowhere. But something else to acknowledge about these is people do get hurt. So in all of these cases, there are people actually getting hurt doing these dumb challenges or following these so-called trends. And it's the same thing with Pokemon Go. On one level, Pokemon Go is just the newest goofball trend that seems to be not only sweeping the nation, but the planet. There's people all over the world who are playing this game. It's also a huge red flag. There have already been some people hurt playing this game. If you look at the possible implications of the game itself, it's rather frightening. As I said earlier, this really is a subject I've covered before. A lot of other people have covered this as well. It's where we're at with technology, how technology is slowly starting to take over us. And all of these so-called challenges, or what I like to call them, New World Order trends, people are getting hurt. And Pokemon Go is no different. It really does show you the merging of technology and humanity. So while these people are running around in the real world, they're still focused on their phones. And they're playing the game. There's an option in this game that's called Placing a Lure, I believe, where you can essentially put your own little Pokemon creature anywhere you want in the world, anywhere, at any time. And then people will come out and try to find it, and collect it, or fight it, or whatever they do. So just think about that. I mean, anybody out there can place one of these lures on the game at any time of day. How about a secluded parking lot at midnight, or somewhere out in the woods at 1 a.m.? I'm just saying, these are very real possibilities, and I have no doubt we're going to see some of this stuff crop up. It's also an incredible distraction. And that's another way I believe they use a lot of these psychological operations. In the last eight years, we've had more mass killings and shootings than any other time in American history. And just over the last few years, it's really picked up. And you guys know what I'm talking about. Every week, there seems to be more shootings, right? More chaos. And this system, the Illuminati, if you will, they are creating this chaos. It will be order out of chaos. They want martial law. They want full control. They do want to take your guns. And these are very serious issues that are happening right now. So while all these very serious issues are taking place, and there's chaos breaking out all around the world, and we're literally on the verge of World War III, we have millions of people all around the world who are focused on Pokemon. They're running around with their phones, and they're trying to capture little virtual creatures and play games, while their entire world is falling apart around them. So that's all I have for you folks. Thank you very much for checking out the video. Take care out there and I'll talk to you real soon. One such example is a ghost named Haunter. And this ghost has the ability to levitate and haunt others. And it is actually a more, uh, there is a more evolved form of Haunter called Gengar. And with this you'll find more advanced powers of the paranormal. This ghost can lower the temperatures around itself and lay curses. 
which we know we see in these shows about hunting ghosts that these are actual entities that are able to do this kind of thing they're able to energetically interact with the world around us should they be called upon now what sparked my curiosity into researching this pokemon phenomenon a little further was that these ghost pokemon that i'm speaking of the haunter and the gengar they are the color purple this color represents the mauve zone now anyone who reads occult literature austin osmond spare Alistair Crowley, Kenneth Grant, you'll see this mention of the Mauve Zone. And what it is, on the Kabbalah Tree of Life, they believe there is this hidden shadow side of the Tree of Life. This is the dark side. This is a play on all of this duality talk we've been speaking of for years. It's the black and white, the male-female, the opposites, the yin and the yang, sort of. And what it is, is on the dark side of the Tree of Life, the shadow realm, there are hidden demons called the Klepoth. Now, Kenneth Grant talked about this in his book called Beyond the Mob Zone. And he talks about how there's these otherworldly entities that have supernatural powers. He says, Access to the Mob Zone has been facilitated in more recent times by the use of magical systems developed by occultists such as Austin Osmond Spare and Aleister Crowley both of whom established contact with interdimensional entities possessed of transhuman knowledge and power. Both systems involve the use of sexual magic to open hidden gates that have remained sealed for centuries. So when they talk about this shadow side of the Tree of Life, I find it curious that if you look up the uh, Pokemon universe, these ghosts, the purple ghost, the mauve ghost, Gengar and Haunter, they are known as the Shadow Pokemon. So it seems they are part of the dark side of the Tree of Life and the Klepoth. Now let's talk about the Evangelical Christian Movement and the Magic Conspiracy. Because when you look up Pokemon Conspiracies, you'll see that the uh, some of the more right-wing Christians are warning us that these are occult demons and our kids are playing with uh, satanic magic. And as much as I try to avoid aligning myself with such uh, judgmental thoughts, I kind of think they're right on this one, and here's why. There are a couple of characters that were originally supposed to be called Hocus and Pocus, but these were changed to the names of Abra, Kadabra, and Alakazam in honor of a spell incantation. Now what this means is this is a specific reference to ceremonial magic. This is exactly what we were talking about, because the ceremonial magicians practice contact with the Tree of Life's dark side, with the Klepoth. Now what Abracadabra means, for those of you that have already read my conspiracy hip-hop book, Sacrifice Magic Behind the Mic, you already know this. Abracadabra is the occult belief in shaping the universe to the practitioner's will. Because the, the word, the term, Abracadabra, has Aramaic roots and it means, as I speak, I create. They are creating the world around us, which is exactly what you see in uh, various New Age literature and practically every piece of occult literature. They are trying to shape reality through the use of magic and contact with otherworldly entities. The term abracadabra was used by witches and magicians, but... Uh, the origins go back to the Gnostic deity known as Abraxas. If you look at the practices of the early physicians, they also used Abracadabra for healing powers, which shouldn't surprise most of you because the Hippocratic Oath that doctors take starts out at the beginning how it's going to, uh, they swear their powers to Apollo and other pagan deities. So again, we find that the use of pagan and occult belief systems is embedded in our culture much deeper than we even know about, than we think about. Now these Pokemon do the same thing. They're practicing with supernatural abilities such as ESP, teleportation, and different psychic, kinetic, uh, telekinesis perhaps, abilities. The magician Uri Geller sued Nintendo over these specific characters because he believed that they were modeling them after him and his supernatural powers. So take a look at the, the character in particular, Kadabra. He's the second uh, generation evolved from Abra. 
And if you look at him, he's got the spoon in his hand because he's uh, you know known to bend spoons with his mind. He's got a red star on his forehead and lightning bolts on his chest. Now these lightning bolts, obviously a reference to the Nazi SS, which had the lightning bolts, which you know there's a cult belief system. It could be the lightning bolts of Lucifer, the fallen angel who fell like lightning from the heavens. Uh, the Illuminati have used lightning bolts in all of our entertainment. In fact, this isn't the first time that they've used the lightning bolt specifically towards children and the use of magic. Another idea is that these lightning bolts are actually waves. Uh, they're not lightning bolts at all, some claim, and that the waves are taken from the Zener cards that were being used in the spiritualism movement of the 1900s in order to test one's mental abilities and powers. Back in the early 1900s, there was an attempt to reconcile the Age of Enlightenment and the Scientific Revolution with religion. So they were trying to research parapsychology, and we've seen many figures who have had prominence in the occult, such as Carl Jung, investing heavily into this. Another example of the Zener cards and the waves in particular is the film Ghostbusters from the 80s where Bill Murray's characters at the beginning of the film, you can see him, he's testing out the psychic powers of a couple of people and he's using the Zener cards, particularly the one with the waves. Now let's also look at Cadaver's red star on his forehead. The red star is a symbol of the communist movement and many theorists claim that the communist movement is part and parcel to the occult desires because it seeks to destroy religion and increase the influence of government, such as the New World Order concept. Now, this red star could also be the symbol of Lucifer, the blazing star. And we all know how the occultists love to worship Lucifer and potentially Satan or the Prometheus archetype. You'll also see the red star in the tragic murder of Sharon Tate and her unborn baby, you know, Sharon Tate was married to director Roman Polanski. And about a year after they released the film Rosemary's Baby, a film that's obviously about a satanic cult that created a what Crowley called the moon child. They created this demon through this woman through sex magic rituals. And on top of that, Sharon Tate was supposed to play the role of the woman that was giving birth to this demon spawn. Anyways, about a year after the release of Rosemary's Baby, she was tragically murdered by Charles Manson and his family. And as most of you know, I've been researching Manson for some time now, and it appears that they indeed confirmed they were in contact with an evil spirit at a house in Los Angeles. Uh, it's a place called the Spiral Staircase, and Manson talks about this in a couple of his a couple of his books where he talks about how they first encountered evil, and he thinks that's when everything changed for him and his family, because they started out as more of a, a hippie commune and turned into the savage occult murderers. So anyways, we saw Sharon Tate wearing the red star briefly before her, before her untimely death. Okay, let's talk about channeling the Pokemon entities. The purpose of Pokemon and Pokemon Go, the app, is to specifically make contact with these monsters. And then the players can use the powers of the monsters and they enter into a contract with the between the player, the magician, and the monster. If you look at the lyrics to the Pokemon theme song, you'll see that they actually talk about this. They say, Pokemon gotta catch them all, a heart so true. Our courage will pull us through. You teach me and I'll teach you. So indeed, the contract between the monster and the practitioner is very similar to what we've seen from the ceremonial magicians of the occult. People such as Aleister Crowley and Jack Parsons have attempted to contact these spirits and entities in order to learn from them. Even Adolf Hitler was trying to channel the extraterrestrial spirits to learn how to fly UFOs. In fact, if you look at Crowley's religion that he started called Thelema, you'll see that he actually received all of this knowledge through a spirit that was channeled named Awas. So indeed, when we see the words, teach me and I'll teach you, we know that this is a classic sign of occult magicians. 
Another concept hidden in Pokemon is the evolutionary indoctrination. Now, this is something I've been talking about for the last couple years. It's the idea that we're seeing all of these superhero films. Uh, we're being spoon-fed this stuff by the entertainment industry. We know that the evolution idea is one that is crucial in both Pokemon and the Illuminati. Uh, the Pokemon game, it's all built upon first making contact with these monsters and trapping them. Which would be done by a magician in the, the occult realm when they trap the entity into what they call the magic triangle. And after they trap them, they have to train these monsters and then they evolve them into the next higher powered character. Let's take a look at the theme song for Pokemon and we'll see more about that when they say, I will travel across the land searching far and wide each Pokemon to understand the power that's inside. Yes, indeed, they believe that there are latent powers hidden within man, and they think that uh, the idea of evolution is that we can eventually break them free, which is what we see in the film Deadpool when they take him underground, which is a sign of classic occult initiation, to take someone underground or underwater, and then they condition... They, uh, they subject them to various trials in order to genetically force them into evolving into a superhero, which is what Deadpool becomes when he uh, resurrects from the ground. And Deadpool isn't the only film or uh, piece of entertainment that does this. We see this in various films, the idea of these supermen and superwomen being further evolved. And there's a reason for all of this. The Illuminati want us to believe that we can learn from demonic entities. They also talk about the aliens and how one day these aliens will be these benevolent creatures that come and guide humanity and give us this utopian kind of uh, peaceful, harmonious world. Some people claim that this is an idea uh, internally projected from mankind because somehow we want to know there's a guiding force that can help us out there and our entertainment is showing that to us and at the same time you'll notice that they're pulling away from traditional religious beliefs and this appears to be a coordinated effort because a lot of the old occultists like Crowley talked about this in uh, the upcoming Aeon of Horus and this new age of mankind where where the male female paradigm will no longer be and they want to make us all transhumanisms where we're sort of uh, cyborgs or perhaps upload our consciousness into a digital matrix. Now I don't want to try and bring you down if you're into Pokemon and if you know maybe you're a parent and your kids are into Pokemon I don't want you to get too overzealous or over concerned about this. I just I feel like if we can just become aware of these principles be aware that there is an agenda an attempt to push evolution and the idea that we should worship supernatural entities that there is a darker agenda at play here. Now, is Pokemon specifically involved with this? I suspect perhaps it could be. If you look at all of this information I've provided, you can see that there are strong ties with the occult belief system. So, become familiar with the signs, the beliefs, the strategies, and the doctrine of the Illuminati, because they seek to push the new age of occultism. If you want to learn more, please subscribe to my YouTube channel and check out the archives I've got on here. I've got several videos. Go to IlluminatiWatcher.com. That's where I post all of my information. And on it, you'll see the option to sign up for an email newsletter. And I highly advise you to do that. It's free. And what it will do is unlock the archival history of IlluminatiWatcher.com. And you'll receive many emails of links to articles that cover this similar kind of material, all supporting the idea that our entertainment is trying to deceive us. They're trying to deceive us because the puppet masters of the Illuminati know where they want to take us in their evolution of consciousness. So become aware and become equipped to fight this battle. Because if you don't, you will be led down the wrong path. Thanks for listening. This Pokemon Go so I watched a few news stories on this latest trend and watching the way people are reacting to Pokemon Go and what they're doing. And I couldn't help but just shake my head. You know, this is just another clear example of massive mind control. 
It's also signaling something from a video I just did recently on the coming post-human world. Because we really are at a crossroads right now. There was once a time where we controlled the technology. But we're literally on the precipice of technology controlling us. So I've never really looked much into Pokemon, and I never played the game or anything, but I remember this story from some years back. It was the banned Pokemon episode that gave children seizures. The animators used a rapidly strobing type technique, and it flashed red and blue lights on the screen. As soon as I saw the red and the blue involved here, it got me thinking of something else. Because this wouldn't be the first time that the colors red and blue were associated in one form or another with mind control. On the color wheel, red and blue aren't even connected together. They're actually opposed to one another. And colors do have a massive impact on our psyche. In a very basic sense, red excites and blue calms. Specifically going back to the article I was just showing you on the mind control they used in Pokemon, the red and the blue, the flashing images. So now you can imagine a child watching one of these animated shows where they take the red and the blue and they flicker them. It's a flicker rate. They start doing it really quick. These children's minds are still developing. They make them the perfect targets for these forms of mind control. A child will just sit there stunned, staring at the screen, while the red and the blue flicker, flicker, flicker. What's interesting to me about symbolism is that oftentimes there's multiple meanings to these symbols and these color codes. I've covered the red and the blue in the past in other videos, how often we see it. The color code of red and blue is really all around us, and I know you guys see it all the time as well. So in that respect, isn't it interesting just how much of this red and blue mind control that we see all around us, specifically in our entertainment, in our media? In one respect, I see it spiritually as choosing which side are you on. And of course, the red and the blue can be traced back to the Masons, back to the Lodge. So once again, isn't it interesting that we find red and blue, these diametrically opposed colors that can be used for a form of mind control, being the primary colors of Freemasonry. And of course, we find the red and the blue, right, with royalty, with the Queen. And that's a pretty famous picture, at least in our community of investigators and looking into this kind of stuff. But that's the belt buckle right there on the, uh, the lady in blue that's shaking hands with the queen in red. In case you weren't sure of the occult connections there. And then, of course, what do you get with the red and the blue? But you get the purple. And then, of course, in the occult studies, the purple goes back to Saturn. Saturn is Satan. One thing people rarely do is read the bottom line, read the print, <laughs> read any of this stuff. And I'm mainly talking about privacy policies that come along with a lot of these apps and stuff like that. This right here is part of Pokemon Go's policy, and <laughs> check this out. We cooperate with government, law enforcement officials, or private parties to enforce and comply with the law. Check this. We may disclose any information about you or your authorized child that is in our possession or control to government or law enforcement officials or private parties as we, in our sole discretion, believe necessary or appropriate, a to respond to claims, legal process, subpoenas, to protect our property rights and safety, etc., safety of a third party or the public in general, and to identify and stop any activity that we consider illegal, unethical, or legally actionable activity. Reading that, considering what you're giving to Pokemon Go, you're literally giving them access to your immediate location and your camera. And you're also giving them full access to your Google account, assuming that's what you've used to sign in. But legally, they've got you, because they put it right here in print. It reminds me of some of YouTube's newer policies. We're seeing so many more videos over the last year or so getting removed from YouTube because they don't fall within community guidelines. And if you read their fine print, it's just like this, essentially giving Google, YouTube, all the power. And they get to decide, at their discretion, the company's discretion. And there are connections to the CIA when you start looking into this. For instance, Pokemon Go was actually created by a company called Niantic. And this is one of their symbols. And of course, we see the rings around Saturn, symbolically. And Niantic Labs was formed by John Hankey. So John Hankey had founded a company called Keyhole, 
and Keyhole was acquired by Google back in 2004. Now, Keyhole received funding from a firm called NQTEL. It's a government-controlled venture capital firm that invests in companies that will help beef up Big Brother's tool belt. And what's more, the funds NQTEL gave Keyhole mostly came from the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, whose primary mission is, quote, collecting, analyzing, and distributing geospatial intelligence. Now here's an excerpt from an in-house publication from the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. Data is king. All hail big data. At first glance, a big data solution may appear to be a silver bullet for an organization's needs. Certainly many sectors have urgent requirements that can be addressed with big data. Companies obtain customer information through avenues such as social media, mobile apps, and customer relationship management software. Government agencies, such as the NGIA, increasingly use big data analysis to derive meaning from the exponentially growing volume of data related to their missions. The main point of showing you some of this is so you understand just how entrenched the government is behind some of these things that seem so innocuous as, a, you know, a Pokemon app. And now we come to the effects it has on the public. I've been into this kind of research for so many years now that I've got the point I don't like using the terms sheep for the general populace that's still asleep. Zombies, that's also another really popular term. Sometimes you just gotta call it what it is. And that's what all these stupid trends really do. They expose the zombies in our society. They expose the sheep or the sheeple in our society in many ways. This right here, of course, was called planking. You've probably seen this. Uh, one of those really dumb trends, right? It seemed to come from out of nowhere and suddenly it took the world by storm. Everybody's planking, essentially acting like they're dead. And who can forget the ridiculously retarded Kylie Jenner challenge, leaving teens' lips bruised and swollen. Of course, there was the dangerously dumb cinnamon challenge. Also, something else to note about all of these trends, these goofball trends that seem to just take over, right, from out of nowhere. But something else to acknowledge about these is people do get hurt. So in all of these cases, there are people actually getting hurt doing these dumb challenges or following these so-called trends, this Pokemon Go. So I watched a few news stories on this latest trend and watching the way people are reacting to Pokemon Go and what they're doing. And I couldn't help just shake my head. You know, this is just another clear example of massive mind control. And some things have a big impact on us and some things don't. I can't think of anything that come over from the Orient that actually had a big impact or a phenomenon type craze other than Godzilla. But there is something new that's come over to the United States and has actually captured the minds and the imagination of every single child. And you know what? It's not new at all. Japanese kids have been watching this thing since 1995. It started out as a cartoon, went to a comic book. They made it into a video game, went to toys, collectible card game. Now, praise God, there's even a, a movie on it. And it was started in 1995. It's not new, but it's new to kids, and they're eating it up. And it's called Pokemon. And it stands for Pocket Monster. And it even made the cover of Time Magazine. Now, the first thing I want you to notice is, do you notice any symbol up there that you've seen before? The spiral. And it stands for what? Male fertility. Okay? Now, this thing is actually called Polyworld, but they actually had another name for it before they renamed it. When this creature first came out, it was called Hypno. And they changed it to Polyworld to make it a little more innocent. 
But you see what it actually does is it's supposed to be able to mesmerize and hypnotize its enemies. And you can see how that would happen. That starts spinning around and it's just like one of those hypnotic wheels that, that they use to hypnotize. And you see up here in the top, here's a creature, an alligator type creature over here, a dragon. Kind of a funny duck build thing down here. And this is an interesting character over here. This character over here is called Mewtwo. And Mewtwo looks like an alien. If you look at him real carefully, he looks like an alien. But you know, the first thing that I noticed about that thing is, when I looked at it, and I looked at those eyes, I said, you know what? That kind of looks like the things that we used to pray to inside that circle. Now you notice that he has a particular salute that he's given. And he's in this pose. Every time that you see Mewtwo, he's in this pose. Now he has three fingers. And those three fingers are always sticking out like that. Now, he doesn't have five fingers like we do. He has three. But if they were the three on us, they'd be this. And that doesn't mean hook em horns, doesn't mean I love you, doesn't mean one more. It means hail Satan. It's the satanic salute that all Satanists identify themselves with. And it says here, you look here, it says for many kids, it's now an addiction. <laughs> Very much so. Cards, video games, toys, a new movie, is it bad for them? What we need to look at is whether or not that particular statement holds true. Is it bad for them? Here's one of the characters. Cute little one. Everybody, okay, everybody go, oh, come on. I know, I know you wanted to do that, see, that's why I did that. He's cute. But the one thing I noticed about him right off, this is Pikachu, one of the things I noticed about him right off was his tail. It's a lightning bolt, and it's a satanic Z. It even comes down here to a point. Now, just by looking at him enough alone is not enough to really be able to say, okay, yeah, that's bad, or that's satanic. What we first need to do is we need to look at the actual production of these things. And the first thing we need to do is we need to look at who actually produced the trading card game that has captured the minds and the imaginations of our children. Now, it doesn't make any difference what I say, it's what their own material says, because their own material will give them away. Okay? So I'm going to read to you, here's the direct quote from the, the web pages of the producer of this game. Listen to this. The Pokemon trading card game is a new collectible card game that is made and distributed by Wizards of the Coast. What is a wizard? Male practitioner of black magic. Wizards of the Coast, the same company that made the best-selling game Magic the Gathering. Magic the Gathering is a heavily occult-laced trading card game which has been very popular in the 90s. And I should also tell you that Wizards of the Coast also owns a subsidiary company named TSR, and TSR is the company that puts out all Dungeons and Dragons material. So let's look at Magic the Gathering, because this is the same company that puts out Pokemon. So let's see where they're coming from. Now, from seeing the symbols, your, your actual discernment should now begin to be sharpened. How many see a circle? How many see a pentagram? Yeah. If you look, there it is. See that? Magic the Gathering. This is a role-playing game. Now, parents, in case you don't know what that is, that means that your child actually becomes a character in the game actually becomes a part of the game. And that's what makes it exciting is there's not many games out there that they can actually become a part of. They can play it, but they don't actually become a part of it. In this particular game, they actually do become a character in the game. And remember it said that it's an occult game. One of the dangers of this thing is being a role-playing game is that it's played with the mind. How many know that the mind is a very fragile thing? And what happens is, in these role-playing games, I'm going to use the example of Dungeons & Dragons because TSR is the one that puts out all their material. The danger of Dragons, Dungeons & Dragons or any kind of role-playing game like this is that 
It's played with the mind, and when played with the mind, the mind begins to lose that fine line with what's real and what's fantasy. And the more you get into the fantasy world, the more it seems real, and all of a sudden now you don't know what's real and what's not. In Dungeons and Dragons, this is a game played by three or four people. And what you do is you have one particular person that's the dungeon master, and he sets all the rules up for this thing. And then in your mind, you actually fight battles. You go through mazes, you go through dungeons, and you actually fight wars with evil wizards, dragons, demons, powerful satanic beings. It's all in the mind. And I mean, if you've got a vivid imagination, you can have one heck of a game. And what happens is, is that you can play this game for 10 to 12 years. Because the object is, as long as your character is alive, you're in the game. Once your character dies or gets killed in that particular game, you're out. So you can imagine that if a person loses touch with reality and now they've actually become that character, guess what? Anything that happens to that character now happens to them. And there's overwhelming evidence, psychiatrists and psychologists both tell us, there's overwhelming evidence showing that a lot of teenage suicides that are caused by Dungeons and Dragons are caused because the player has finally lost touch with reality. And what's happened to them now, they actually feel a psychic bond with that character. And so the character gets killed off and no longer in the game, you have no, no purpose because all your purpose was for the last 10 to 12 years was playing Dungeons and Dragons. So your character gets knocked off, guess what? So do you. So let's go back to Magic the Gathering. Here's one of the cards. Yeah, ain't he cute? This is Cabal Ghoul. Now, you notice that there's counters up here. In other words, this stands for two points. And it says Cabal Ghoul. Now, if, in case you don't know what a ghoul is, it's a dead, rotting, decaying thing that's been in the ground and magically summoned back to life. So you have a walking, dead thing. And that's what a ghoul is. And in this particular thing, it says, at the end of each turn, put a one plus one counter on Cabal Ghoul for each other creature that died during the turn and was not regenerated. In other words, you have cards that'll actually keep your character alive for a certain amount of time. Here's another interesting card. Because it's called the All Hallows Eve card. Again, this is all in magic. Magic the Gathering. By the way, there was a news clip that I read about two weeks ago that spoke of a young boy in Maine. I don't remember what the town was, but it was in Maine. And he came home one day and asked his mother about Magic the Gathering and said that the teacher had decided to use Magic the Gathering, this card game, as a new and exciting way to teach mathematics in, in school, in their class. And they even formed what was called a magic club and that all the kids were part of this magic club. Well, the mother said, well, you're not going to become a part of that. You're not going to be in that. But one of the kids had given him one of the cards and that card he showed to his mother. And that card was called Necromancer. And on that card, it showed spiritual beings actually being risen up out of the ground, out of their grave. And then he asked his mother, what does summon mean? And she said, why do you ask that? And she said, he told her, he said, because all the kids on recess go outside on the school grounds, pick up huge sticks, wave them in the air, and say, spirits, enter me. True. This is All Hallows' Eve, again two points symbolized by two skulls. Here's your demonic black cat. I guess it's a black cat, I've never seen anything look like that. There's your demon in the middle, jack-o'-lantern, full moon, and it says this card is called sorcery. Sorcery comes from the Greek word pharmakeia. It's where we get the word pharmaceutical. In occultism, it's witchcraft through drugs, sorcery. And it says put two counters on this card, remove a counter during your upkeep, and when you remove the last counter from All Hallows' Eve, all players take all creatures from their graveyards and put them directly into play. Treat these creatures as though they were just summoned. You choose what order they come into play. Remember that again, this is a role-playing game. 
This is called the magician. I wonder why. Here you see the man kneeling, and look, he's forming with his hands the triangle. Right there. And he's kneeling in front of a flame. There are the crescent moons behind him. Over here can only be demons. Hellfire all around here. And it's called the magician. And these are collectible cards. And these are cards that one day your child may come home with or may know of a student that has given him some of these cards. Now you will know what they are. So let's go back to Pokemon. Because now we've, we've, we've already established that the same company that puts out that game and puts out Dungeons and Dragons puts out cute little Pokemon. Isn't that interesting? Now, before we go any further, I want to see that if we as a group can agree on something. So I need little audience participation here to say yes or no. Okay? We are, are you into that? Yeah. Okay. Listen to me carefully. If we examine the characters of this particular program, and they are the kind of role models that we want our kids to be watching. In other words, if, if this whole game, the characters of this game, the monsters, this whole premise of this thing actually goes to establish the kind of values, the kind of standards, and the kind of morals that we want our kids to have when they reach adulthood, that it's okay. In other words, if they actually help to establish the kind of morals, values, and standards that we want our children or our grandchildren to have when they get to be an adult, that it must be all right. Can we agree on that? Okay, so what we need to do is we need to examine and see what kind of role models we have in this game. Now, what we need to do then, everybody go, oh, again. Oh, I know, he's cute, isn't he? Little satanic tail. Up here is the Pokemon ball, okay? That's this thing here, okay? And inside of that, you catch the Pokemon. Let the camera get a view of that. That's the Pokemon ball, and you actually catch the monster inside of that thing and harness the power in there. And then you can call on that power to regenerate itself outside of that ball. And praise God, it turns into a bigger and better monster. <laughs> now, we're told that there are 150 species of these particular creatures on the face of the earth. And we're also told in the material that these pocket monsters are creatures that inhabit the world with humans. And that they can evolve and grow in bigger and better creatures. Now, the object of this game is got to catch them all. And they tell you that if you catch them all, you become a Pokemon master. Listen, parents, that word master will appeal to any child because they can become a somebody. They can become a master. And you know what? If you're the master of something, you don't need mom, you don't need dad, you don't need grandparents, you don't need aunts and uncles, you don't need school, and you probably don't even need a church because you're a master. You can become a god. That's the premise of what this has been teaching. You become the Pokemon master. That's the whole premise and the whole goal of this game. Now. This is the main character right here. He's called Ash Ketchum. Not Hal Ketchum, but Ash Ketchum. Okay? And I'm, again, it doesn't make any difference what I say. It's what their own material says. I'm going to tell you what, what they describe him as. Listen to this. An energetic and determined 10-year-old who's a little too competitive, and he's obsessed with catching all Pokemon and driven to become the world's foremost Pokemon master. And you know, every time that your children watch this program, whether it's a video, whether it's a cartoon, whether it's a comic book, no matter what it is, they hear this mantra, this rap song that's played over again. And it says, I will travel across the land searching far and wide each Pokemon to understand the power that's inside. And then it's enchanted to them. Gotta catch them all over and over and over and over again. You know what it does? It fuels your child's craving for more cards, more books, more videos, more movies. It's designed to do that. That's what we call enchanting. Here's the next character. This is Misty. Look at this. 
Now this is off of a comic book. This is actually a page of a comic book. But if this was clear, if this was actually clear, you'd see that that's a halter top. It stops right there. And she's got short shorts on. And you know she's got to be about the same age as what Ash is. Okay? And she's described as Ash's companion. And listen to what it says about her. She's headstrong and stubborn, constantly arguing with Ash. Typical woman. No, just, just kidding. God forgive me. All right. Frivolous spirit. That's what it was. And here's Brock over here in the corner. And Brock is by far the most hormonal because his fascination with the opposite sex many times gets him or the group in trouble. Well, then there's Pokemon trainer Gary. And Gary's not pictured in here. But Gary is a real self-centered jerk. He's vindictive and he's obnoxious. And then there are two characters, and one's called Jesse, and the other one's called James. And listen to what it says about them. It says, prepare for trouble, make it double. Jesse and James are an evil gang looking to steal rare Pokemon. Jesse and James are stuck up, fashion conscious, and you know what? In the program, they're also prone to cross-dressing. Now, if you don't know what that means, that means that if you feel like you're a woman in a man's body, you wear women's clothing. You dress like one. If you're a woman who feels manly, you wear men's underclothing and dress like one. Cross-dressing. Oh, what kind of role model would that be? Okay, now remember at the first, I think that's enough right here, because I think we've got a pretty well good establishment on this thing. Remember that I said that if the characters were the kind of role models that established the kind of values, standards, and morals that we wanted our kids to have when they got to be an adult, that this game or this particular thing is okay. Remember we said that? Okay, so let's examine what we got. Let's see. Uh, headstrong, stubborn, quibbling, self-centered, vindictive, obnoxious, hormonal, sexually preoccupied, evil, thieving, cross-dressing jerks. I don't know about you, but I mean, even if I wasn't a Christian parent, I wouldn't want my kids to grow up with those kind of traits. Then we have to actually say that the characters of this game don't biblically stand up, do they? In other words, they don't represent the kind of values and standards we want our kids to have. And they're definitely not the role models we want our kids to be. But these are the characters that our children are identifying with day after day after day playing this game, watching the cartoon, reading the books, looking at the videos. Now we're also told that these actual beings have supernatural abilities. In other words, they can evolve and grow into bigger and better monsters. Now this is a scene, actually this is a poster from the movie. And look here, this is Mew, this is Mew over here, M-E-U, he's kind of cute. And this is Mew 2 over here, complete with his satanic salute. And if you notice, that pose is always given with the left hand. That's significant. Remember the left hand path? And we're told that they get bigger and better. Of course, that's what we always want. Bigger and better monsters, that's what the world needs. And we're told that they get bigger and better through the use of energy. Now. A funny thing happened, well it actually wasn't funny, but an interesting thing happened when this movie, the Pokemon, was actually first released in Japan. I want you to see it. This is from CNN. Look at this. Because this is very highly unusual. Japanese cartoon triggers seizures in hundreds of children. And look at this. This is Tokyo, December 17, 1997. This is when the movie was first actually released over in Japan. The bright flashing lights of a popular TV cartoon became a serious matter Tuesday evening when they triggered seizures in hundreds of Japanese children. In a national survey, the Tokyo Fire Department found that at least 618 children had suffered convulsions, vomiting, irritated eyes, and other symptoms after watching Pokemon. Japanese television network NHK reported that 111 people were still hospitalized Wednesday morning. 
And now, spokesman Hiroshi Iromoto said that a later broadcast of the show scheduled for 30 other stations nationwide had been canceled and that an investigation was well underway. We are shocked to hear many children were taken to hospitals, Iromoto said. We will investigate thoroughly and consult with experts. And you know what they found? Not one of those children had a history of epilepsy. Now, you know, working in the mental health field for as long as I did, I can tell you that bright flashing lights will trigger off in several, uh, in occasion, seizures and convulsions in kids or even adults that are prone to be epileptic. But not in a hundred and so kids who have no seizure problem and no epileptic history. There's something unusual about that. And they went through, and it goes on further to say that they went through and even did CAT scans. And the whole premise was that at the end, they had to conclude that they don't know why it happened. Is that by coincidence? Or did something happen that they can't explain? Remember I said that they get their energy through energy balls. And here is a picture of little cute little Pikachu and he's being energized by an energy ball. And now you notice he's not quite so cute anymore and his little satanic tail is really erect. And now parents, if you're not up on Pokemon, you need to be. And one of the things you can do is go out and buy the official Pokemon trading card game player's guide. And you can get this at any store that sells any of the Pokemon stuff. I mean anything. Uh, you can get it like at uh, uh, Toys R Us or any of those places that sell any of the Pokemon. And it says on the back of this, catch them all, then build an un unbeatable tournament deck. And one of the things you can do is look through here because it shows every Pokemon in existence and it tells you what their powers are and it tells you how they get weak and it tells you how they energize and what you need to energize them. But something very unusual is also in this book and that is that they actually show the energy balls that, that is used to make these monsters bigger and better. I want you to see them. I hope you can see them from where, where I am. Um, I'm going to hold it out here so hopefully you can see it. Look at the yellow. What do you see? Lightning bolt. Lightning bolt. Look here. All seeing eye. Everybody see that? Up here is the clenched fist, symbol for rebellion, anarchy. Right down here is a powerful witchcraft symbol where my finger is, powerful witchcraft symbol, and it's a symbol for fire. Down here is another powerful witchcraft symbol, actually a new age symbol, they call a new age symbol for earth. Okay, which is a green leaf. And down at the bottom here, this blue ball down in here, is the symbol for energy of water. And water transforms into wind. Earth, wind, and fire, the three basic elements of all witchcraft, parents. And I'm going to ask you, parents, grandparents, concerned aunt and uncles, friends, do you think they put that in there by coincidence? Do you think they just built this game, put these on there, and said, hey, let's just put those symbols on there. They look cool. Kids won't know what they are, but they'll like them because they look cool. Or did they put them on there because they know what the meaning of each one of those symbols is? And they want to desensitize our children to seeing those symbols so much that when they see them in other things, hey, no big deal. There is a devised plan going on for the battle of our children's minds. There's a war going on right now for the children because Satan wants them really bad. Who better to serve the Antichrist than the youth? And the whole object is to catch them while they're young. Remember the old, remember the, the Pokemon motto, gotta catch them all? Who do you think feels that way? It's the enemy. Gotta catch them all. Gotta get them while they're young. Gotta induct satanic doctrine. Gotta put these symbols in their spirits. Gotta put these monsters in their heads.
got to mess up their dreams. Got to mess up their reality. Got to break up the family. Have you ever tried to get a, 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 talking to a child when he's into this game? It's impossible. They spend more time on this Pokemon. And you know what? It's amazing that your child can tell you every Pokemon in existence, even tell you where they get their power, what they do, and how they do it, but they can't tell you what you told them five minutes ago. They also can't tell you probably what they learned in school that day. And even worse than that, they can't quote you scripture. There's something wrong. And I'm talking to the men right now because, you know, men, we've been given an awesome task by God. We have nothing to say about it. You know why? God tells us that we're the priest of our homes. Yes. We are the ones who say we are going to follow God. I don't care what anyone else does, but as for me and my family, we are going to serve the Lord. Yes. We are the ones who are supposed to say this stuff is going to be allowed and this stuff is out. And ladies... Women of God, you've got an awesome task ahead too because the Word of God says that you're to raise your children in the ways of the Lord. Not in the ways of these Pokemon, not in the ways of witchcraft or Satan worship, but in the ways of the Lord. Are we doing that? Or are we subtly giving in? This is a picture from one of the comic books. Look at this. Pokemon Psychic Surprise. <laughs> Surprise, all right. Look at this. This <laughs> creature right here is called Haunter. And I talked to three kids in three different cities who actually came up and told me that they were having bad dreams and that creature was in their dreams. Called Haunter. That makes sense. Haunt. Right up here is a creature that's not quite so cute now. This over here is not quite so cute. Little Pikachu down here, he's crying his eyes out. He's not cute, and even Ash doesn't look cute anymore. Psychic surprise. And you know, going back to those energy balls, I believe that those energy balls represent that the Pokemon get their power by supernatural occult ability. You saw the symbols. Remember, the materials speak for itself. They give themselves away. And what made that even more evident was two cards. One was called Abra, and the other called is, called is called Kadabra. Abra, Kadabra. And that's an actual phrase. It's an actual name. Listen to this. Webster's Dictionary defines it as a word supposed to have magic powers and hence used in incantations on amulets, etc., a magic spell or formula. And on the Abra card, it says, using its ability to read minds, it will identify impending danger and teleport the user to safety. The Kadabra character has a pentagram on his forehead. And he has SSS across his chest. And it is the satanic SSS. And in my particular sect of Satanism, we didn't have it, but I ran into other groups that did. They had tattoos on the inside of their wrist over their breasts or on the inside of their thigh, and it was that same SSS. You know what it stands for? Satan's Solemn Servant. And also, the Kadabra character is always pictured on the card with his left hand giving the satanic salute. And again, I have to ask you, do you think that's on there by coincidence? Do you think they just made this game and said, hey, let's just throw that in there because it looks good? Let's just throw that in there because it makes it look a little more exciting. Or did they put that in there because they know exactly what it means and they want our children to get desensitized to it? They want our children to be able to look at that and actually at one day now, while they're identifying with their favorite Pokemon, reach up and go, hail Pokemon! And what are they actually hailing? Satan. Listen. Our kids are carrying around these cards like they're magic symbols. And they are taught to believe that they can call on the powers of these cards anytime they want to. And I ask you, do you believe that our kids believe they have power? Or do you think that, they, that it's just, this is just nothing but talk? Because if they don't believe that it has power, why are we seeing time after time after time news clips 
about our kids beating each other up on school grounds, even stabbing each other over Pokemon cards. Look at this. Quebec teen stabbed at school over Pokemon cards. This was in Montreal. And this was a 12-year-old student that tried to help his younger brother after his younger brother had his Pokemon card deck stolen from him. And he went over to these young men to get the cards back, and one of the boys pulled out a four-inch knife and stabbed him with it. Look at this. Boy attacks teacher over Pokemon. Here in Lakeland, Florida, there was a young boy who had a, who had a deck of Pokemon cards, and he was passing them around the class, and the, the woman teacher noticed that they were paying more attention to Pokemon than they were her. So she waited for the deck to get back to this young man, and then she walked over and grabbed that deck out of his hand. He got up and struck her dead in the face with his fists. And he, of course, he got called in on the principal's uh, carpet on, in the office, and they called for the parents. And the parents came to pick him up, and you know what he told his father? They were trying to steal my powers. Our kids are taught to believe that these things actually have supernatural ability and that they can call on them anytime they want to because their material states that. In this book, it tells your child, you have the power at your fingertips, so use it. And that's what they're doing. This game is a war designed to attack our children's minds, their very character. And if it gets into our homes, it will wreck family life in one way, shape, or form. This stuff is nothing more than unadulterated witchcraft, and it's put in a child's form designed to attack the child and the parents and the entire family that this thing is associated with. That's exactly what it's designed to do, and that's what it does. Pokemon is a step to bigger and better things in the occult. And I have to wonder sometime if, when a, a, a grade school child is going to do what the Weeping Bell Razor Leaf Pokemon card says. It says this. It spits out poison powder to immobilize the enemy and then finishes the enemy with a spray of acid. And these cards cost anywhere from $7 to $9 per single pack. And there are report after report of children going into their parents' pocketbook and stealing money to go out and buy these cards. What is the purpose? What is the magic that's behind the whole game of Pokemon? I think by looking at it in that realm and looking at it the way that we've looked at it, I don't see it as being something that is beneficial to our children. I don't see it as being something that's going to help our family grow. And I sure don't see it as something that's going to help get the child established in the ways of the Lord. This is totally the opposite. Remember that the whole goal in all of these role-playing games, and especially in Pokemon, is to become the master.